Hi, folks. So um, hopefully you've watched the first two videos. Those set out the general background, both of pre-Socratic philosophy and the ancient Greek world, uh, and then turning our attention to Socrates um, and the reconstruction of Socrates' uh, thinking and philosophy, uh, primarily through Plato. And then we looked at Plato uh, as the uh, recorder, but also uh, of Socrates' thinking, but also as someone who then clearly goes on to develop his own uh, uh, thinking. I mentioned in uh, that previous uh, video lecture that it seems that the central question for Socrates, as much as we can gather, uh, based on Plato's reconstruction of him, uh, is the question, how do I live well? The sense that, and if I cannot answer that question, if I cannot live well, uh, then all other speculations are uh, in vain. Now, when we look at the way ancient philosophy in the Western tradition develops, we see three separate areas developing uh, from the point of Plato onwards. The first area is the one that we're going to begin with um, in this week and in this module, namely uh, the question of morality or ethics. Uh, the other two areas are the study of reality, ontology or metaphysics, and the third area is epistemology or the study of knowledge and truth. When it comes to the question of morality, uh, we can initially reflect on the, the very word ethics. It's a Greek word, it comes, it derives from the Greek word ethos or ethos, uh, which means both character and habit. Um, so somebody's uh, habitual behavior is what marks out their character and that's what tells you about their ethical standing. Uh, we'll see that resonance between character and behavior and ethics come out very strongly when we consider Aristotle's ethical theory. In this case, in this lecture, I want to look at um, uh, some excerpts from Plato's um, dialogue, Gorgias. And before that, I'd like to look at some precursors um, because the question of ethics clearly is not inaugurated by Plato. It's a question that he inherits from uh, earlier thinkers. So uh, to that effect, um, let's look, first of all, take a, a step forward. Um, here we have a quote from Aristotle from his lectures on rhetoric. And Aristotle says, or writes, let happiness be said to be doing well together with virtue or self-sufficiency of life, or the most pleasant life together with security or affluence and possessions, together with the power to protect and make use of them. <laughs> That's a fairly complicated uh, account of happiness. Let me say something initially about the word happiness. Bear in mind that uh, obviously none of these texts uh, were written in English. And they were written in ancient Greek. And uh, the word that is translated as happiness in English is the Greek word oidaimonia. Oidaimonia, if you literally translate it, it has the central term uh, daimon, daimonia. Uh, daimon, which is etymologically connected to the English word demon, uh, means a sort of spirit. Oi, um, or e u, uh, means good or well. So oi daimonia means literally well spiritedness. Um, it's a, a nominal form. Um, sometimes oidaimonia is not translated as happiness, but more flourishing. Um, and as we'll see when we turn to Aristotle's ethics in more detail in a future lecture, um, in that case, um, flourishing means in Aristotelian terms, being the, the best kind of human being that you can be. Uh, being an excellent human being is essentially being a morally valuable individual. Um, here in this definition uh, or account in the rhetoric, there's more going on. Um, first of all, the idea of virtue in Greek, arete, um, that is translated 
uh, also as excellence. The word virtue has a certain um, Christian overtone, a certain religious overtone uh, for, the, for most English speakers, which isn't particularly helpful. Um, virtues are excellences by which Aristotle means ways that people demonstrate they're very good at doing certain things. So you could have the virtue of uh, playing golf well, for example, or you could have the virtue uh, of uh, playing a certain musical instrument. Now, we wouldn't use the word virtue typically uh, in those contexts. The word virtue as a, uh, as a translation of the Greek word arete uh, comes from the Latin virtus, uh, which has to do with power or strength as in virile and virility. Um, so it's a power or a skill or an excellence. So uh, happiness said to be doing well together with virtue. Um, so doing something well, performing something. Uh, that's the idea behind this, doing something with excellence. Uh, or self-sufficiency of life. Um, this hits on uh, a kind of motif that we find a lot in uh, uh, ancient thought, ancient philosophy, namely that the best life is the life where I am least dependent either on things or on others. Um, that's not the life of selfishness as it might appear. Um, it, it's not because selfishness would be typically exploiting other people, exploiting things and so forth. The reason why ancient Greek thinkers tend to think of self-sufficiency as a necessary element of the good life is because it minimizes uh, the prospect that you will lose uh, the prerequisites to happiness. If you rely on others uh, and other things, uh, wealth and possessions and so forth, then these things can be lost. Uh, things happen uh, over which we have no control as an individual. And if our happiness and sense of well-being relies on these relationships uh, too much, um, all these things, these material things too much, uh, then we're at risk of uh, lapsing from happiness into unhappiness. We're more at risk. So the idea is the more autonomous uh, our sources of happiness are, the more they're at our disposal, uh, the better the life. So that's the idea there. Um, there's an alternative definition here, the most pleasant life together with security. Um, pleasure and happiness will, is something that we'll explore uh, in, in uh, both in this lecture, but also in future lectures. Uh, the Greek word for pleasure is hedone, uh, from which we get hedonistic. Um, and um, most philosophers in the ancient world agree that pleasure is a necessary but not sufficient condition for uh, happiness, for leading a flourishing life. Um, there are some exceptions to that, um, as we'll see. And certainly there's a lot written about the nature of pleasure. Um, and also it's important to say that not all pleasures are morally equal. Uh, so typically speaking, uh, physical pleasures uh, to do with food, sex, and so forth, are considered inferior pleasures, um, partly because they're short-lived. Um, whereas, uh, say, you could say the more refined pleasures, um, the pleasures of reading and so forth, uh, of culture, of music, uh, these things are seen as more permanent. And generally speaking, the more permanent a source of pleasure, uh, the, the higher it's rated, morally speaking. And again, there's that concern with permanence. Um, the happiest life is the one that is most permanent and most consistent. And again, that is a thought that's pretty consistent uh, across different thinkers of different times in, uh, in the ancient world. We'll see similar uh, ideas, for example, in the Roman period uh, reception of Stoicism. Um, but I wouldn't want to give you the sense that this idea of uh, autonomy and self-sufficiency rules out uh, human relationships, in fact, quite the contrary. Uh, in Aristotle's ethics, uh, which we'll examine in, 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 in future lectures, um, Aristotle devotes uh, a whole substantial section to uh, friendship and the importance of friendship uh, in leading the good life. 
So just to dispel that potential confusion. Um, however, friends should be chosen carefully um, and um, we should also be prepared potentially to, uh, to see friendships come and go. So, you know, there's a sort of concern even with that, but certainly friendships, social connections, being sociable um, is, is key. It's part of what we are as a human being and therefore it's necessary to the good life. Um, Aristotle again is himself is a bit of a realist, so he's not um, he's not puritanical about possessions. He realizes that in order to lead a reasonably good life, you need a certain degree of material um, comfort, and so he acknowledges that. Uh, so again, Aristotle tends to steer away from a more ascetic perspective on happiness, which would uh, very much see possessions as a threat to the good life rather than something that facilitates them, but that's, uh, he's comfortable with a certain degree of material security. So that's just um, a brief glimpse and a, and a sort of warm up exercise uh, in terms of understanding um, what the core concern is in ancient ethics, namely uh, how to lead the good life and uh, the state in which one is leading a good life is referred to as happiness. So um, another source that we have in uh, Annas's anthology is uh, Herodotus, who is um, an ancient Greek historian. Um, obviously, the philosophers as such didn't have uh, a monopoly on saying things uh, about the good life. And in Herodotus, we find... Um, a sort of anecdote that's repeated down the ages uh, about Solon, who is seen as a, a lawmaker and a sort of archetypally wise man, uh, talking to a Croesus, uh, who is proverbially the rich man. So if you like, the rich man uh, uh, asks, uh, sorry, the wise man asks the uh, rich man who is the happier of the two. So you know, here we have a contrast between, if you like, the, uh, you might say, the inner riches of wisdom and knowledge, as opposed to the outer riches of wealth um, and uh, possessions. Um, and Solon is reported by Herodotus to have identified uh, the following elements uh, in the flourishing, happy life. Firstly, reasonable prosperity. You know, that's something that is echoed in Aristotle. Flourishing children, so the idea of um, uh, something outliving you, something that will, uh, if you like, honor and commemorate your life. Um, interestingly, a noble patriotic death, um, uh, dying in military action um, uh, is seen as honorable, um, simply holding on to life for no reason. Uh, you know, self-preservation uh, can be base, can be uh, immoral uh, if there's something of higher value that requires your life. Um, and, you know, this is something that um, is uh, fairly common. Uh, the good death is a motif uh, in ancient philosophy, both uh, ancient Greek and ancient Roman. Um, so there isn't particularly a squeamishness about death. Of course, that's different to taking one's own life in a voluntary way uh, for no particular reason outside of a social context, that would be entirely different. Um, the idea here is that uh, honor will accrue to uh, the person who uh, is willing to give up their life for a greater cause, or something beyond themselves and their own immediate self-preservation is seen as honorable and noble and moral. Uh, and the fourth element that's mentioned here is luck. Um, which uh, is an interesting element. Uh, it's interesting because um, it's by definition beyond the agent's power. Uh, so uh, fortune is an independent thing, um, but being fortunate uh, is the sign, if you like, of, uh, or a constituent element of the good life. Um, so, you know, this to some degree will uh, anticipate some of the material that we'll look at later on in later lectures um, uh, during our short term 
uh, namely issues around human agency as opposed to divine agency and where there's an intersection between those two things. Um, so as I relate this, as I see this, uh, this story uh, emphasizes the precarious precariousness of human happiness. Um, uh, you know, what's at stake in all of this? Uh, much of it is not uh, in the power of the individual. Mm. And uh, to drive home the underlying message uh, that Herodotus ascribes to Solon, uh, it is that it's better to die with dignity than enjoy a long and ignoble life. So again, there's the issue about it's the quality of life uh, that counts. And it's also crucially the reputation that you leave behind you. Uh, clinging on to life uh, can be, uh, is perfectly consistent with uh, being ignoble and, and leading an immoral life. The simple perpetuation of life in and of itself um, is not valuable. And uh, that tells us something interesting uh, about the ancient Greek conception of happiness, that it's really a question of how I live my life and not how long I live for. Um, uh, you know, you might think, well, you know, demographically or whatever, uh, how long do people live in the ancient world? Well, uh, we know in the case of Socrates that he lived to uh, around about the age of 70. And uh, so we don't have to imagine these uh, ancient people as, you know, having uh, nasty, brutish and short lives. Um, they were living in, uh, you know, civilized city communities. Uh, admittedly, here we're really referring to the perhaps 10 percent enfranchised citizenry. Uh, who were privileged. They weren't uh, subject to manual labor and so forth. So obviously we have no accurate um, uh, data, we have no data whatsoever for uh, overall demographics. Um, but certainly we know that among the privileged class uh, of citizens uh, living to, to 70 or beyond was, was not, uh, certainly not unheard of. Um, <clears throat> Continuing more than with uh, a historian, um, uh, uh, sorry, not a historian in this case, uh, Democritus, now turning uh, properly to uh, a philosopher, if you like, in this case, a pre Socratic philosopher, but barely pre Socratic, uh, really more or less a contemporary um, uh, of Socrates, um, but you know, predating somewhat. Um, we have this statement as, as a fragment I mentioned uh, two lectures ago that what we have from the pre-Socratics are essentially fragments, fragmentary writings. Uh, usually uh, these are ones that we found that, that are embedded in later texts. So we don't have a lot of context for these, but the fragment from Democritus states the following, the end goal of human life is cheerfulness, which is not the same as pleasure but a state in which the soul lives calmly and stably, disturbed by no fear or superstition or any other passion. Um, what's interesting about this fragment from Democritus is uh, it anticipates, uh, as we'll see uh, in week three, uh, when we look at issues around um, uh, truth and knowledge, uh, this is something of an anticipation uh, of the skeptical and stoical view uh, of the good life, namely that really the good life is not about, is, is ultimately, in a sense, negatively characterized. It's the lack of uh, um, fear and anxiety and bad luck and all of these other things. Um, hence, uh, the soul living calmly and stably and undisturbed by fear or superstition or any other passion. So the idea here is it's, it's a kind of unperturbedness right it's it's sort of being um being in a calm and settled state of mind over a long period um so that's more of a as i say more of a negative characterization uh of human happiness and again i think it points to the sort of precariousness of the human condition there are so many bad things that can happen to somebody um you can lose family members you can succumb to disease uh, you can be killed in war, you can be swept up into a civil war, and so on and so forth. So 
in a way, the best we can hope for is uh, minimizing all of that stuff. Uh, but again, what's interesting about this is it's not so much focused on what the agent can achieve, what the individual can achieve and promote their own happiness with, um, more so um, what they can manage to avoid over their lifetime. So I think that's worth noting. We'll see uh, quite a shift, I think, um, when we look at the Socratic Platonic doctrine of the good life. Um, so as I say, um, this account uh, seems to anticipate some of the motifs in Stoic um, and Epicurean ethics uh, in relation to what in Greek is called ataraxia, uh, which is generally translated as unperturbedness. Um, and as I've mentioned as well, um, this description gives the impression of a negative assessment of happiness, um, but to some degree is better understood as an active, as active self-control and self-discipline. So um, although this is, has this kind of negative feel to it, um, there's still the idea that this is an achievement of the individual. Um, to maintain calmness uh, points to this uh, cardinal virtue uh, that we see time and again in ancient Greek thought and ancient Roman thought um, of self-control um, and sort of preserving that sense of self-control. So passing on then to uh, Plato's Gorgias, um, what's going on here is um, a depiction of um, <clears throat> of uh, a sophist, Gorgias, the person named in the dialogue, as in many of Plato's dialogues, um, is, is a person, an individual, um, an actually existing sophist. Um, we see other, uh, there is a, a later dialogue, a middle period and quite complicated uh, uh, dialogue of Plato's called the sophist. Um, but equally he has dialogues named after Gorgias, he has another dialogue named after Protagoras, um, both of whom are recognized as sophists. And the sophist is the main interlocutor, uh, the main uh, person, uh, character in the dialogue uh, with whom uh, Socrates gets involved. Mm. Now, uh, I'm not going to presume that, that you're familiar with the word sophist. Um, so let me say a little bit about that. The term sophist um, has a relationship to the term Sophia, uh, as in philosophia, uh, Sophia being um, wisdom. The philosopher is the lover of wisdom. Uh, so too, the sophist has this allusion to wisdom. Uh, so uh, the sophist, if you like, presents as a wise uh, individual, someone who has learning to impart. Um, but Plato spends a lot of his time in the dialogues essentially uh, condemning the sophists as quacks, as uh, basically peddling false, what we would call pseudoscience. Um, that and what the, the logic that Plato uses to critique the sophist is that, you know, sophists are interested in appearance. Um, I mentioned uh, in the first lecture was that um, there's a very important distinction in Plato uh, between uh, conviction and true knowledge. Conviction, the, the term for that in Greek is pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S. One could be convinced of something, but have no real basis for it. Um, you know, and psychologists and uh, sociologists and ethnographers and so forth um, study this kind of a phenomenon. And, you know, there are modern essays, uh, for example, William James's essay, The Will to Believe, uh, which point to this, if you like, cognitive tendency that um, it, it's, uh, the, the sense, the, the mental state of conviction um, is very appealing. We like to feel conviction. We like to feel a sense of security in what we believe and think. Um, 
and we might have multiple reasons for believe for, for, for what we believe. Um, but it's very important as Plato sets out what he considers philosophy, that conviction is not seen as a necessary and sufficient condition of truth. It's not so much um, being convinced of something that's important. It's what that conviction rests on that's important. And in order to do that, you need to have some sort of account as to why you believe what you believe. And that account has to be shareable among many others. Um, in fact, that's a sort of definition of knowledge, or at least one constituent feature of true knowledge, is uh, that it's demonstrable and it's shareable. That is to say, you can point to the grounds for what you believe, and those can be uh, appraised uh, uh, by others and demonstrated. Yeah. Um, so whilst conviction may be uh, a necessary feature of knowledge and truth, it's not sufficient. Um, and I think that's pretty clear, right? Um, I might believe anything and everything. Um, that doesn't make it true. Um, and uh, the, so to come back to the critique of the sophist, the sophist is somebody who is skilled at instilling uh, a sense of conviction, but not educating people into the truth. That, according to Plato, according to his presentation in dialogues like this, the, like the Gorgias, is the domain of the philosopher. And that's what distinguishes the sophist from the philosopher. Uh, the sophist um, generates a sense of conviction, um, whereas the philosopher creates conviction through true knowledge. Um, and that's a absolutely cardinal and important distinction for Plato. Um, so to sum up um, the distinction, um, I list here four uh, characteristics uh, of the sophist as portrayed by Plato. Firstly, the sophists argue both sides of the case. Um, the idea in sophistry is that, um, you know, it, it's more like perhaps a situation that we would be more familiar with in a legal setting. Um, if I hire an attorney and I want them to make my case, then they'll make my case. Uh, of course, they'll try to use evidence and so forth, but you know they're hired by me, so they have a vested interest in presenting my position and my truth, if you will. Right? That's more along the lines of what the sophists do. Um, Plato's depiction of the philosopher is that they ruthlessly go after the truth. Um, you know, the idea being that they're impartial investigators into the truth. Um, there's a different methodology as well. So the second point. Sophists tend to deploy long speeches, whereas philosophers use a kind of quick question and answer methodology. And that's the, uh, the, you know, the so-called Socratic method that we see in play, uh, particularly in the early dialogues um, of Plato. Later on, uh, this sort of back and forth uh, tends to recede somewhat and actually uh, long speeches uh, become more characteristic. Um, but that is seen, at least initially, as a distinguishing feature of the philosophical method. Uh, thirdly, um, and perhaps we can just see this as a sort of the snobbishness of somebody that, such as Plato, who presumably uh, inherited a lot of wealth, um, that sophists charge money, whereas philosophers don't. Um, I think the idea behind that is a pretty obvious one, which is that if you start charging people money for something, then you know, the, the veracity, the reliability of the information that you're getting um, uh, can be more questioned. Um, the idea is that if the philosopher is not charging money for what they teach, then um, they don't have a vested interest in teaching certain things. Uh, I think what goes along with that is that if um, you're dealing essentially with clients, then you're gonna be much more inclined to tell them what they want to hear. Um, and fourthly, and this might seem like a rather strange element of critique, but uh, it seems important to Plato that the sophists are itinerant, that's to say they move from place to place, uh, whereas the philosopher is more uh, fixed in one locale. Uh, again, this may just be a prejudice on Plato's part, the idea that someone remains loyal and remains situated within a certain nation, uh, within a certain city state, 
uh, in Plato's eyes, uh, seems to give them a, a, a higher dignity. Uh, certainly, as I mentioned in, in the first video, um, uh, and as we see in the defense, uh, in Socrates' defense of himself, uh, in terms of the trial of Socrates as depicted by Plato, then um, this idea of being loyal to one's city-state uh, seems to be quite high pro profile. Um, there might simply though be here in play a kind of prejudice against strangers uh, and uh, what would effectively be in our term, terms non-nationals. Uh, that is to say, these people are considered foreigners even if they come from other Greek speaking city-states um, because I've explained previously, uh, citizenship connects to a city and not to some broader sort of nation state. So those are the four markers or four markers of distinction between the sophist and the philosopher. But to get to the core teaching in the Gorgias, and I think this is where, you know, the, the crucial material lies, um, the key tenet, as I call it here, is the following, as enunciated by Socrates, that there's nothing worse than one's doing wrong. Um, and it's qualitatively worse than suffering wrong. Um, when Plato enunciates this, when he sets this out, uh, he's aware, clearly aware, that there's something paradoxical about this. If we go back to some of the earlier definitions of flourishing, then um, uh, protecting oneself from harm would seem to be one of the key features of the happy life. Whereas the Socratic teaching seems to be uh, that suffering wrong in, in and of itself is not a bad thing. And it's certainly not as bad as inflicting wrong on others. Um, there's a kind of underpinning to this that we need to sort of explore. Um, but the immediate objection to this perspective is, well, you know, isn't that just uh, allowing people, if you like, to do bad things to me uh, and not particularly worrying about those things? Um, certainly, uh, throughout many of the early Socratic dialogues, the opponent of Socrates' position uh, argues that, well, you know, this is just a, an ethics, as Nietzsche would later like say in the 19th century. This is just an ethics for weak for, for those who are weak and cowardly. Those who can't really get ahead uh, in the world preach a doctrine uh, of uh, meek uh, acceptance when wrong is done to them, because simply they don't have the power uh, to get what they want from others. So they create this ethical doctrine uh, that suffering uh, at the hands of others is ultimately okay. And the last thing you should do is seek revenge uh, and do something wrong to others because that's that would be the truly morally damaging thing. Um, uh, be that as it may, the important thing is to, at this point, is really to try to understand uh, what the Socratic, Platonic uh, moral thinking is. So we need to explore that further before uh, we make any rash judgments about the credibility of this ethical theory. Um, so uh, to recap, the contention can, can be considered here, or the position, the ethical position, can be considered counterintuitive um, if you measure this against uh, prudential self-interest, self because here uh, suffering wrong amounts to sustaining damage to one's own self-interest. Um, so being wronged essentially means uh, in this context that something goes against one's own self-interest. Um, whether someone defrauds me of property or um, a friend betrays me and so on and so forth. Uh, these are things that run counter to the immediate self-interest of the agent. Um, and so um, it would seem at first glance that these are uh, that these are morally worrying things to happen to me. Um, but there seems to be in play here something that is greater than self-interest than just getting ahead 
um, and maintaining these advantages. And it's important to understand what that something might be. Um, uh, so as is typical in the Platonic Socrates, um, we get this uh, sort of hypothetical figure of somebody, let's say, who more or less uh, has complete power to do what they want. Um, now, it would seem at first glance, this is the ideal situation for anybody to be in, right? Um, if you imagine that you know, you're, you're more or less unchecked in your power, you have great social influence, uh, you have great financial resources, you'd think, great, you know, I, it opens all doors, uh, I get anything I want, all the services are rendered to me, um, uh, who wouldn't want that life, right? Um, so again, rather counterintuitively, uh, Plato Socrates argues that actually this is, this is pretty much close to, to the worst of all possible lives. And the, it's, it's both a character type, but it's also a political figure, namely the tyrant, because the tyrant is somebody who is depicted as having this type of power. Um, nothing else can oppose them. Nobody else is stronger than them. Um, there is no force that's greater than them in society. Um, but Plato's psychological conviction about such character um, is that they are very, very likely to lead the least morally successful life. Um, and part of this, again, would go back to this concern with self-control. Uh, the psychology of the tyrant, the all-powerful individual, for Plato is a psychology of somebody that gradually loses all uh, control over themselves. Um, they pleasure runs a mark um, and they simply lose touch with themselves. Um, you know, I guess it's tempting to think of contemporary analogies of this with extremely famous, uh, rich or both uh, characters who, um, because they don't really have to listen to other people, because they don't really have to care um, about how they impact others, uh, become increasingly out of control. And the only people that they're willing to actually converse with or relate to are those who offer a very flattering uh, image of themselves. Um, so they lose, in other words, the control, the, the, the ability to critique themselves and to therefore restrain themselves and they start to act more and more with a sense of impunity and untouchability. Um, so again, whereas on some level, this seems like the ideal sort of life because you can literally do what you want, uh, that type of freedom, uh, morally speaking for Plato is extremely dangerous uh, with relation to my moral status. Um, <clears throat> so, the takeaway here is that the capacity to avoid, to avoid all adverse action from others does not ensure one's ethical well-being. So again, this figure of the tyrant, this idea of being in a position where you're, uh, in a sense, least vulnerable uh, to others is not an ethically ideal situation to be in. Um, precisely because the only person who can get to that point where they're untouchable uh, the psychology of that is likely to make somebody arrogant um, and uh, irresponsible uh, because they don't fear any, uh, any, any, any checks or balances in relation to their actions. Um, now, in conjunction with uh, the ethical theory um, that we get um, here is uh, the question of pleasure. I mentioned that uh, pleasure and happiness uh, are often thought of and thought, thought about in conjunction in ancient thought. And just about every ancient ethics uh, has to deal with the question of pleasure. It's seen as a primary problem. Um, now, one way to understand and decode the, uh, this figure again, Plato's figure of the tyrant, is that they lead a life of uh, unbridled pleasure. Um, and one of the ways to get at 
the reasons for that not that unbridled life of pleasure not actually amounting to happiness is to do with uh, Plato's reconstruction of the psychology of pleasure, particularly physical pleasures. Uh, Plato uses this uh, image of um, a leaking bucket, um, and that you know what what he's getting at is um, what we now know in terms of the psychological principle of a kind of law of diminishing returns. That is to say that um, particularly physiological pleasures uh, diminish over time and that you need, as it were, more and more stimulus to uh, reach the same level of pleasure and gratification. And so there's a kind of treadmill that, uh, that kicks in um, and the tyrant's appetites therefore become uh, more and more uh, pronounced and eventually out of control. Um, and again, this flies in the face of a genuinely good life because whilst the tyrant appears to be um, safeguarded and, and, and not reliant uh, on external uh, things, particularly other people, because he's got, as it were, everyone uh, is serving him uh, by definition, and nevertheless, the tyrant is lost to themselves, as it were. Right? They sort of lose themselves uh, in the power and status. Uh, that they have, and in this sort of uh, sort of treadmill, in this sort of hamster wheel of uh, trying to gratify themselves, um, but needing more and more uh, input or stimulus, as it were, to maintain that sense of gratification. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, the upshot of this is that the life of pleasure. Uh, whilst it might, in a vulgar sense, be seen as the optimal good life, it turns out to be quite otherwise. That if you maximize pleasure uh, for the individual, then actually it's more likely to lead to vice and misery than the opposite. Um, <clears throat> the question uh, about immediate appearances or common uh, assumptions as opposed to philosophical insights is the point here raised in bullet point three. Um, this points towards the appearance and reality dualism, which is important in Plato's thinking and in ancient Greek philosophy more general, generally. So the idea here is that if, while well, most people see uh, optimized or maximized pleasure is the good life. Um, but that doesn't make it true. Um, I mean, this can be seen as just a sort of, uh, if you will, an elitist perspective on knowledge. Um, uh, but it's important to notice that, um, that if common perceptions are all correct, then there's really nothing for philosophical or scientific inquiry to discover. Uh, because everything is already known. Um, and, uh, you know, one way to sort of reconstruct how ancient Greek philosophy, uh, through many twists and turns, leads into scientific methodology, this would be one particular aspect. There has to be a sense in which a commonly held opinion is not uh, the final truth of things. Um, uh, and that further inquiry is needed. And this is an example is that, you know, the reason why moral philosophy is needed, moral reflection, moral inquiry is needed is precisely because uh, common intuitions about this uh, are not reliable. Um, so that's what's going on here um, in relation to bullet point three, um, that something to being held by many, many people is true, doesn't make it true. Um, and instead there's a process of thought um, by which uh, we penetrate into actual truth, into actual truth, to the position of actual knowledge. We could think here back to uh, the allegory of the cave again, um, you know, that's the depiction of appearance and reality. Of course, the folks who are sitting there looking at 
the shadows on the wall all think, well, you know, the only, uh, the best we can do here is have some theories about the shapes on the wall and maybe people who can predict the next shape that's going to show up, you know, these are the truly wise people. Um, but the truth is that, you know, everyone's caught up in illusions and they, no one has actually penetrated through to the true nature of reality. And that's the task of philosophy, you know, and the, the fact that, so to that extent, the tension with everyday thinking is uh, built into the image of philosophy. And again, when you heard the, hear the word philosophy, philosophy, um, it's probably more helpful to think to hear the word science. Um, you know, if if our folk wisdom was enough, um, then what would be the point of scientific experiments and, and scientific inquiry? Um, we could just rely on our common intuitions about things, and there wouldn't be anything more precise to the matter to investigate. But clearly, uh, our whole scientific culture uh, relies on uh, a presumption other than that. Um, uh, so, uh, to come back to this question of happiness, which is the underlying question uh, in Gorgias, um, happiness cannot be. Uh, produced uh, by pursuing pleasure and simply escaping harm done to others uh, um, in, 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 such a, in such a pursuit. Um, you know, in short term uh, or in short form, the life of pleasure is not the life of happiness. Now, that's not to say that pleasure shouldn't be a constituent part of the good life, uh, but simply that it's not sufficient. Um, certainly not sufficient to the to the good life, and that's a that's a common thought um, held uh, by most ancient thinkers. Uh, and there's a kind of uh, theory of the self underlying this, and this is common certainly to Platonic philosophy, but again, ancient philosophy more generally. In order to say what the good life is. Um, typically in ancient philosophy, we need to say something about what it is to be human. Um, and to say something about what it is to be human is to say something about um, uh, what, is, what is essentially, what is essential to the human condition. And in the Platonic Socratic teaching, uh, there's, a, there's a mind-body dualism and the mind or the soul um, the um, the suche in Greek um, is the essence of what it is to be a human being. And so uh, the body is to that extent non-essential to the moral life. It's not the body uh, whose excellences we need to refine if we want to become happy. Uh, it's the soul. So um, the damage that she's done to us, to the essential self in the unbridled life of pleasure is a damage to the soul. It's the soul, if you like, that gets forgotten. Um, we don't have to think of the soul here in a religious uh, or specifically Christian way, although uh, it is important to notice, to note that historically elements of Platonism and Neoplatonism uh, certainly entered into uh, early Christian thinking and early Christian doctrine. So there, there is a connection. Um, but of course, uh, when we're looking at Plato here, we're looking uh, at writings that predate the earliest Christian writings by 400 years. So we have to make sure we get the chronology uh, correct in these situations. So briefly then to sum up uh, this, uh, analysis of the Gorgias. Um, ultimately, Plato is saying the life of pleasure is not the good life. There must be something more to it. That itself is predicated on the idea that pursuit of bodily pleasure uh, neglects what is essential to the human being, namely the spirit, soul, or mind. And these two things, the body and the soul, are uh, radically distinct. Uh, for Plato, and it's really the soul that should be nourished and cultivated in the good life, not primarily the body.
Um, so to reiterate what is essential to the person is their spirit or mind and keeping this part of themselves in the best shape is the basic goal in leading a good life and leading a moral life. Um, and we might suspect here that there's a kind of radical rejection of the body. And certainly there's some, uh, you know, you can reconstruct uh, Plato's writings in an, in an ascetic direction. That is to say, it's a kind of body denying philosophy. There's certainly elements of that. Um, but I think the more accurate position here is that uh, happiness is really uh, a balance of uh, the mind and the body. Um, after all, you know, Greek culture was a highly physical culture. Um, bodily prowess was considered important. Um, you know, the average Greek citizen would be, um, you know, working out, if you like, exercising, doing sports. Uh, military prowess was considered important. Uh, Greek culture is full of, you know, beautiful human bodies. The Greek gods themselves are endowed with sort of superhuman bodies. Um, so um, it's important not to overplay the, if you like, anti-body element in Plato's philosophy, although again, it's important to notice that in subsequent Christian theology, uh, the sort of the elements of Plato and Neoplatonism that were more sort of opposed to the body and bodily pleasures to some extent do get accentuated. So there's definitely a way that you can pick up on this mind-body dualism to a sort of wholesale condemnation of the body. Um, but I don't believe that that's uh, a credible way of reconstructing Plato's philosophy. It's just that um, the physical pleasures alone will not be sufficient to attain the good life. Um, there's also a theory of punishment um, in the Gorgias. Um, and one way to capture that is to say that the doctrine of punishment why you should punish someone for doing the wrong thing is not so much a retributive thing, you're not trying to correct the balance, you know, uh, in, instilling pain in somebody for its own sake or deprivation for its own sake, but it's more restorative. That is to say that, you know, you would punish somebody in order to appeal to them or to prompt them or to some extent to coerce them uh, back towards the cultivation of the soul. Um, and that would be the purpose. Um, uh, so, you know, there's, a, there's an interesting um, take on the idea of justice, um, uh, of the justification of punishment here as well. Um, and then finally, uh, we can say that justice, because the ethical, and as I mean, you might think of justice as a, as a, as a sort of uh, more of a political notion or a sort of social notion, um, but doing justice to oneself is really a crucial moral sense, right? I have to do justice to myself, um, which means doing the right thing by myself. So it's it's equally a moral, or in fact, even more importantly, a moral concept in Platonic philosophy. So justice um, <clears throat> means keeping yourself in good order, um, balancing, if you like, the different elements in play within the human being. Um, and certainly that idea of a balance is very, very important in ancient concepts of justice. And as we'll see when we turn our attention to Republic, um, Plato often uses this microcosm and macrocosm, the, you know, the good so society, the good polis, the good city state, um, it really resides in good citizens who have this internal balance within themselves. So balance between the elements in the human condition is also a key way of defining the sufficient conditions to achieve happiness. So hopefully that's been useful for uh, having a first look at Plato. Um, we'll continue our exploration of ancient uh, ethical theory in the next video. <laughs>